Good morning, everyone. Where's my little bag of tricks? I think I left it back at the soundboard. Would somebody mind bringing me the little bag that is uh, sitting beside? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, April. So um, how's everybody doing this morning? It is really good to see all of us back. Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure, like, I, I guess that everybody would know that, that this mysterious Simon and Melanie that we've been referring to are our new pastor as of this week. And his wife, Melanie, who uh, is, yes, welcome. And our old pastor, of course, is awesome, too. I think that was louder, so, yeah. So, um, about half a year ago, we began this process of asking God to provide us with the next pastor, with the next leader uh, for this beautiful and wonderful church. And um, God has heard our prayers, and God has used the incredibly hard work of our uh, search team and our other leaders to bring us Simon and eventually Melanie. Um, and so, actually, you know who really deserves a huge round of applause is Linda Richards. And who were the team that worked with you to uh, find that pastor? Uh, Adam, Geek, Adam. Adam Geek, uh, yes, Adam Hemming. I almost said an old friend. Um, yes. Mark, Mark Campbell. Mark Campbell. Mike, Malone. Mike Malone. Ingrid. Ingrid Van Vlyman. And, and Mickey Gallagher. Thank you, search team, for all your work on our behalf. <laughs> I know how hard that process can be and that it feels a little bit like a mechanical process sometimes, but I believe the Holy Spirit worked through you guys to, to bring us just the right pastor at the right time. And so when a pastor comes into a new church, there's usually a, some sort of a ceremony ritual service that happens to recognize that. And that is generally called, at least in my tradition, I don't know how it is how you've heard it termed before, an installation, pastoral installation, which I always thought was a little silly because it sounds like you're like installing a new motherboard in your computer or installing kitchen cabinets. Like now if you come by the church through the week, he'll just be there hanging on the wall like I'm your new pastor. So anyway, uh, I don't know what would be a better word. I thought of blessing. I thought of commissioning. I thought of covenanting, and really what I want to lead us through right now is, is all three of those things together. Um, asking for God's blessing, blessing, commissioning Simon in his ministry, and covenanting or committing together to be a part of this church and what God is doing here. So, uh, one of the images that I've been thinking about a lot as I thought about this transition is uh, in, in a race... A relay race when the first runner passes off the baton to the second runner. And so here I am kind of finishing my race and passing the baton to Simon. And so I have, I have this baton here to represent that. Um, if you've ever watched the passing of a baton in an actual relay race, you will realize it's not something simple. It's actually pretty complex and carefully mm -hmm. planned because you do not want to drop the baton. Uh, you can't just chuck the baton to the next person. There's a, a process involved where the, uh, the next runner comes up to, to run at the same speed in front of the, the first runner, and there's a period of time where they both have their hand on the baton in order to carefully pass it. And that's kind of what we're entering right now is, is a, a month or so, or maybe a month or two, where we both have our hand on the baton, and it's this careful process of handing it off, hope, hopefully not dropping it too many times along the way. Um, and then what happens is the first runner in a, in a race will sort of veer off and stand and cheer the second runner on. And so that is my commitment to you, and I will be giving this to you, uh, both as, as a... Um, a sign of you running the race in the next phase, but also as my commitment to hand it off to you in a careful and uh, well thought out way and to let go of it and then to cheer you on. <laughs> so those are all important parts. You know, we're not going to be running around the track with me going, oh, 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 just 
I'm going to let go um, event eventually <laughs> in the next couple months. Um, and so I'm going to give this to you as a symbol of that. So here's this. Also, I've written on there some verses uh, that have meant something to us over the years. On one end are some of the key verses that I, that, that God, I felt, gave me as I was planting MCC. On the other end are some verses about your role and uh, the pastoral commissioning as you start. Now, another metaphor that has meant a lot to me, uh, which I shared with you last week, if you were part of our Zoom calls, I talked about how the, the pastor is to the church like a conductor is to an orchestra. So imagine with me that the church is an orchestra. Every person in the church plays an instrument, maybe a couple, um, but every person has a place in that orchestra. And we come together to make the music of the kingdom of God. So the, the music that Jesus wrote 2,000 years ago that's been passed down to us in the scriptures, which are our score, that we can all read the music from, and, and we play this music together, not for each other, though it's nice to hear each other play, but we play this music together for the world around us. We want the world outside of these four walls to hear the music that God is playing through Jesus to this day, and we want them to fall in love with it the same way we have and to join our orchestra and become part of what we're playing here. That's the ultimate goal of the church, is, is not to somehow entertain each other, but to help people clearly hear the, the message of the gospel and the music of the kingdom of God. And so within that, the pastor is, is yeah, in some ways, the pastor is another performer with his own instrument, his own gifting, his own skills, but the pastor's primary job is not to be a soloist, but to be the conductor who releases, equips, cheers everyone else on as we play the music together. Um, the pastor stands in front not to get all the attention, but to help to unify and guide the church in terms of what piece of music they're playing at that moment, in terms of the proper rhythm, when different people need to come in. And so if you unscrew the end of that, the, the one with the longer black thing, you will find... By the way, does anybody know what the stick is that a conductor uses to uh, conduct an orchestra? I would call it like the music stick or the magic wand. Anybody know what it's called? Baton, baton is correct. And so within the baton is a baton to symbolize me handing off not only the, the race handing off this position of releasing these people into ministry. So, so baton has two uses, and it, the package even looked like a baton. So it was pretty cool. So that is my gift to you. Um, I have more gifts this morning, which originally were intended for you, Simon. But because of what I've just said, I realized that... Um, it would have been inappropriate to give them to just you. I have gifts today to symbolize our mission as a church, the one that we have the, uh, talked about since the beginning, since actually before we ever even started our first service. And so I was going to give the gifts representing our mission to Simon, and then I thought, wait a minute, that would actually go against what I've just said, because it's not Simon who owns the mission alone. He plays a role in that, but it's actually all of you and myself included uh, that own the mission of the church. And so I'm giving these gifts to all of us as a church, and my hope would be to uh, display them somewhere. For right now, I'm going to set them on this little um, thing. So does anybody know what the first of the four aspects of our mission happens to be? It's because we've never put it up on the wall. Experiencing God is the answer. And so the, the gift I have to represent this uh, is this grapevine, and grapes, uh, they're fake, don't worry, um, but they represent a very real uh, truth, which is that when it comes to our lives, when it comes to our ministry as a church, our ministry as individuals, and just our everyday life, Jesus taught that in order to bear fruit, we need to stay connected to the vine, and he said, that vine is me, I'm the vine, you're the branches, 
You remain in me, you stay connected, and you'll bear fruit. And so the most important thing we can do for, for each other, for ourselves, and as a church is to stay connected to Jesus and to help the world around us be connected to Jesus in a growing relationship. So that's what experiencing God is all about. It's not, we're not here as a church just to help people know about the Bible or about God or to somehow be more religious. We want people to have a relationship, a connection to Jesus, and that's where fruit in our lives comes from. And so that is my gift to you to remind you of that. The next thing is following Jesus in sacrificial obedience. And for that, I have this cross. Um, Often we think of the cross as a symbol of Jesus dying for us. But in this case, uh, I'm giving this cross as a symbol of the fact that Jesus invites us into a discipleship relationship, that we follow him personally, individually, and communally on a daily basis. We do what he does, and we follow his teachings. And at the heart of that is this thing called dying to self. It's not an easy process. And so Jesus said, if anybody wants to follow me, they need to take up their cross, come after me, and die to themselves on a daily basis. And so this cross is a reminder that that we're not just in here to get good feelings from our relationship with God, but we offer him our whole lives. We die to our own selfish desires, and that is the, the invitation that we're putting out there for the, to the world around us, not just to come in and feel good, but to come in and die to themselves and follow Jesus, and in doing so, to find the life that they were meant to live. The next <coughs> part of our mission is to love each other in authentic community. That's because an orchestra is no good if it's just one person. The, the music comes together when the people come together. And it's the same in a church, that it's our relationships with each other that uh, allow, in many ways, God to work. And so it's not just enough to show up on Sunday and listen to the preacher, but being a part of a community where we demonstrate God's love to each other is absolutely essential to what a church is. And so to symbolize that, I have this plate and this cup which represents the body and blood of Jesus that we share in communion which again often we think of as communion with God but the scriptures actually teach that also represents our communion with each other a deep spiritual relationship that God creates because we're all in Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in each one of us and so in I think Corinthians It says, and this has been, for our denomination, this has been the words of institution, the words of communion have been, because there's one loaf, we together are one body, and because there's one cup, we together uh, form one community. And I misquoted that quite a bit, but you get the point, right? Uh, The point is that, that communion symbolizes not just our relationship with God, but the love that we show each other and the deep relationships that we enter into. The final aspect of uh, our mission has been to serve the world in generous stewardship or as generous stewards. In other words, God has given us as individuals many gifts, finances, time, talents, um, relationships, spiritual gifts, and he's called us together Not to keep those to ourselves, but to use them wisely and to follow in his footsteps and to serve as we have been served by Jesus. And so the symbol of serving the world around us, that that our church exists not for ourselves, but for the people outside of our walls, and that our posture to the community around us is not to be one of defensiveness or judgment, but one of service, I have to symbolize that, a basin to wash some very tiny feet, <laughs> and a pitcher and a towel, which is, again, part of our brethren heritage is to actually wash feet, if you're brave enough, uh, once or twice a year, a, a humbling 
experience of serving, but because Jesus did that for us, we do it for each other, but not just for each other. That is our posture as a church and as individuals to the world around us, to our communities, to our neighbors, to the people we work with every day. We are here like Jesus to serve. And so that is our fourfold mission. I think that maybe that's the first time we've talked about it. Um, it's a reminder, and, and I give to you and to all of us these gifts to help us remember who we are at the heart. So. Okay. So now what I want to do is lead us into a time of verbally expressing our commitments. Um, and so first I'm going to have Simon. I asked Simon a few questions, four to be precise, uh, to which the answers are yes. <laughs> or let me think about it and I'll get back to you. But that would be awkward. So, um, And then I'm going to ask us as a congregation four questions. Now, I recognize there are people here today online, maybe here, who aren't ready to commit to us as a church, that you're just sort of visiting or checking things out. And so I'm not asking you to say these things if you don't mean them, but only if you do. Um, so, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to robotically say them if, if uh, somehow they don't ring true for you. But I'll ask you those questions in a minute. So I'm going to ask Simon some questions. Do you want to come uh, up here two meters away from me? And I'll ask you these questions. And then Adam is going to pray for you. Um, first a scripture, First Peter 5, 1 to 4 says this, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So to be the lead pastor is a huge privilege and has huge responsibilities. And it's a burden that is too heavy for any one of us to carry on our own. But we serve a chief shepherd who promises that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so we do our best and then we trust that he will fill in the rest. So Simon, will you lead this church to accomplish its disciple-making mission, looking to Christ as your example, the scriptures as your foundation, and the Holy Spirit as your guide? Yes. <laughs> Will you serve the body of Christ by contributing your own gifts and equipping others to use theirs? Yes. Will you prioritize your own relationship with God and practice self-care so that connected to the vine, your ministry will bear fruit that will last. Yes. And will you love these people and this community with the love of Christ to the best of your ability? Yes. Amen. Adam, would you pray? Heavenly Father, loving Son, gracious Spirit, thank you so much for the call you have on Simon Lint's life. Thank you so much for his loving wife who supports him uh, to follow your lead. Thank you, God, that he's sensitive uh, to your spirit's leading, that he's willing to respond, that he's willing to love a broken world that you love. Thank you that he's willing to minister within Muskoka, within MCC, within the world that you have created and want to redeem. God, I pray that you give him a supernatural uh, patience, fervor. Um, give him or allow him to continue to grow in the fruits of the spirit. 
pleasant to stay connected uh, to you, relying on you for for bringing those uh, fruits. God, I pray for the practicalities of this transition, this kind of technical handoff between two uh, great spiritual leaders for our little community. Um, as much as the saying is the devil is in the details, I pray that you are in the details of this handoff. Um, thanks for your your love that we can't comprehend, we can't put into words. Thank you that you are far bigger than us, that you are far bigger than our strivings. Um, and I pray that this time, as uh, the people who kind of intersect with MCC over the next bit look back at this period, I pray that it, it's just a wash with your love and grace and, and your spirit moving. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So now, you guys, this is partly based on uh, what I talked about last week in terms of what a church's responsibility is to its pastor, in the same way an orchestra has responsibilities to its conductor. Um, and so I'll reread the, the passage I used as my primary passage last week, Hebrews 13, 17. Have confidence in your leaders, not because... They have it all together, but because God has called them into that position. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. So, church, Will you, will we give ourselves, first of all, to the mission of this church, contributing your gifts under the guidance of the Holy Spirit? If so, say yes. yes. Will you submit to the leadership of this pastor, following him as he follows Christ in accordance with the scriptures? Yes. Will you pray regularly? for Simon, asking God to give him guidance, wisdom, protection, and fruitful ministry? Yes. yes. Will you love Simon with the love of Christ, accepting his weaknesses, celebrating his strengths, and giving him the grace and space he needs as a fellow disciple? Yes. yes. All right, Emma, can I ask you to pray for us as a church? For this church. Thank you for these people. Thank you for being faithful to us, for providing us with Simon as our pastor. Thank you for creating us as a community, as people who grow in faith together to support each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other, to draw each other towards you to strengthen our relationship with you. God, there's been a lot of change, and sometimes change is really hard. And sometimes change causes us to, to shut down or turn away. I pray that you open our hearts and our minds and accept what, what you're giving us, which is such a beautiful gift. Our church continuing and a new, a new pastor, a new leader who's going to bring new ways and new ideas and new paths to you. I pray that these are, are ways that help us to grow and to love you, to grow deeper in our relationship with you. I pray that you continue to guide us and protect us and draw us in together. I pray that our relationship deepens in this place. I thank you for your love. I thank you for um, the gifts that you give us, especially um, in each other in this church. It is such a special place to be able to, to worship you and grow in you. 
been through. Amen. Amen. I, I would like to offer my own prayer now, so if you would continue praying. Uh, Simon, normally in our uh, tradition, we would lay hands on you. And uh, if anybody has two-meter arms, they could do that. But I'm thinking nobody probably does. So just know that spiritually, uh, let us maybe even reach out our physical arms toward him as we, as we bless his ministry. Jesus, it's been 16 or 17 years since you gave me a glimpse of your desire for a church here. And to think of all that you have done in those years, and the lives that you have touched through your church, not least of all would be my life, the way that you have grown me and led me each step of the way. I thank you. Thank you for the privilege of pastoring and loving these people. Thank you for the privilege of leading your church. And now, in Jesus' name, I pass the leadership authority that you've given me on to Simon. And I ask you to bless him in the same way that you've blessed me. And that you would bless others through him in the same way that you have used me and that you have used us. God, strengthen him. Let him feel your presence at all times. Let him trust in you when he doesn't. Give him wisdom. Give him direction. And God, give him power. Power that goes beyond human ability. It taps deeply into your Holy Spirit who is alive and active among us. And God, may we as a church bear much fruit for your kingdom. God, right now there are people all around us who don't know you but are spiritually hungry and thirsty. And I pray that you would use us as a church under Simon's pastoral leadership to reach those people, to give them a warm and gracious welcome into your family. God, we as a church, we've been drifting a bit for a while. Part of that, I think, is because of me and my own transition. But we're ready, God. We're ready for what you have for us next. Make our hearts soft again. Revive in us a passion to serve you and to make a difference in this world. And God, would we follow Simon as he follows you faithfully, making his work a joy at every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. At this point, I would give you a hug, even though, as people will tell you, that is not my favorite. (laughs) So, we all win today. So, Okay, now I'm so great to be in church and to have worship, isn't it? What a beautiful thing. Uh, thank you uh, so much for your wonderful uh, warm welcome this morning. Um, and I would also just like to say uh, thank you to Linda and to the selection committee uh, for all of their hard work, uh, all of their grilling me. I'm just putting myself back together now. And uh, uh, what a great blessing that they have been. And I'd also like to say thank you also to David and Wendy for uh, uh, connecting us with MCC in the first place. And for their just incredible generosity and kindness. Uh, It's such a blessing. And uh, April and Jeremy, I just want to say thank you so very much for uh, your incredible humility, your love and your care of this church, and your love and your care of me and Melanie, and you don't even know us, and you have just blessed us no end. So thank you so much for everything and all that you've done for us so far. Uh, and uh, I will, I don't want to drop this. I thought it was a cigar. I don't, I don't, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't want to drop this, and it's such uh, a thing to carry, and uh, so we need to carry this together, and uh, I'm just so grateful for the privilege of being able to hold this. Uh, it's an awesome privilege. 
It's an awesome thing being in the kingdom of God. And it's an adventure. And you never know where he's going to take you. And you never know what he's going to do through you. But you know what he's calling you to. And that is to be disciples and make disciples. And I just am honoured to be able to have this. So thank you. Uh, it is... Oh, that's a wobbly table. Uh, it is a wobbly table. <laughs> we'll see how we... Uh, we have got glass in it. We'll see how we go. So I am... It is Palm Sunday. So I am just going to read uh, uh, just a very short passage... And then we're going to crack straight into it, if that's okay. I'm just going to read from John chapter 12, verses uh, 12 to 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given his, this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, oh, I, whenever I'm looking at a passage of Scripture... Um, I never read it cold, as in when I look at it, I always usually have to, have to go back to see what came before it. You really want the context of the word that you are reading so that you can get the fullness that's in it. And this bit in chapter 12 really is a continuation of the story of the sign that Jesus gave in chapter 11. In chapter 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, Jesus had raised people from the dead before. In fact, Jesus had done like phenomenal miracles before, but there was something about this miracle that really spoke to the people. And it kind of, I find it a bit weird because, I, and I hear this with Christians all the time, how we measure impossibility. How we will believe that one miracle is possible, but not another miracle is possible. The amount of Christians that I know believe in the resurrection, that one day they know that they are going to die, but they are joyfully going to be resurrected to life. And they have no problem believing that whatsoever. But the virgin birth, or, or dare I say the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, nah, that's just a story, they think. How you measure one impossible against another impossible is beyond me. But here they kind of seem to be doing that. This miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead somehow spoke to them more than anything else that they'd seen. And great crowds came together. In fact, at the end of that chapter in 11, it's, there's such a furore. There's so much going on with the people that the Pharisees hear about it and they decide there and then they've gone too far. We need to kill Jesus. Now, we can read this stuff, we know this stuff, but just get your head around that. The religious leaders of the time have decided they are going to kill Jesus. Now, we know when we think about Pharisees that they're the bad guys, right? If this was like the theatre or something and they, they came on, everyone would be like shouting boo and ready to throw things at them. But back then, when this was happening... They were seen as the good guys. They were seen as the holy guys, the ones that, that, that were the higher echelons of society. And they turn around and decide they're going to kill Jesus. The only people that knew what the, really the Pharisees were like were Jesus and John the Baptist. And look what happened to both of them. So as a result of them wanting to kill Jesus, Jesus hears that. 
probably in his spirit and he heads off to a place called Ephraim, which is out in the countryside because they've also given out orders. If anyone sees Jesus or his disciples, let us know because we're going to arrest them. So Jesus, now get this, Jesus is almost on the run. The religious leaders and their decisions have caused Jesus to retreat. You think about that and, and how much you can get out of that. The, the, the decisions that we make can affect Jesus. Well, Jesus decides to come back because you can't hold him back. And when he comes back, he comes to the house of Lazarus. And there are Lazarus's sister, Mary and Martha. And they are ecstatic because they have had their brother raised back to life. They're chuffed to bits and they have a big party because Martha just loves putting on a spread. And it's just like this fantastic thing. And loads of other people turn up because everyone's come for Passover. There's three festivals that um, every Jewish man has to go to in Israel in, the, in that year. And one of them is the Passover where they celebrate that Jesus has, uh, sorry, uh, that God has delivered the people from slavery. So they're all at Jerusalem waiting for this festival and they're just talking to themselves, murmuring, thinking, is this guy Jesus going to turn up? Like no one's seen him for a little while, but is he going to turn up? What do you think? And then they find out that he is back at Lazarus's house and they're all over it. They all want a piece of him. And then we get to this point where Jesus then walks towards Jerusalem. As he starts walking towards Jerusalem from Bethany, the people just go nuts and they can't contain themselves. They are not Canadian. They are not British. They just, they, they just can't hold it in. They, 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 just, they, they just let it go. But what were their expectations of him? They cut down palm branches and throw them before him, which was a sign of royalty. They say, um, Hosanna, which means he saves. Hosanna to the son of David, to our king. They want him as their king. Remember that they're, in their context, they're an occupied country. Rome is just stamping down hard on Israel. They are slaves in their own country and they are looking all the way from the old testament they are looking for this messiah figure the anointed one to come straight out of scripture and to deliver the people of israel and this guy has done he has raised the dead he has healed the sick he has cast out demons he has he has uh, caused blind people to see the deaf to hear he has just done this incredible amazing things and then boom Raises Lazarus, who'd been dead for four days. Even his own sister's like, don't roll away the stone. He's going to stink. And Jesus raises him to life. So they have a hope in him. But what are their expectations? Even we're told the disciples didn't know what was happening until after Jesus was glorified. Even they really didn't get what was happening at this moment that Jesus was entering Jerusalem. Now there is a prequel to this in the Old Testament. You will find that the Old and New Testament sit on each other. It's like a blueprint and the actual building, the actual reality. And if you go back to uh, 2 Samuel, you will see that um, Hophni and Phinehas, who were the uh, uh, priests at the time, who were sinful and they were complete muppets. They, Israel was at war with the Philistines and they thought what a brilliant idea it would be if we take the Ark of the Covenant out to the front line and then Israel would be just like, yay! And the Philistines who've heard about the Ark of the Covenant, which is like the covenant that God has made with his people, they understand the power that's in this covenant, is the holiness of God. Like when they realize that it's there, they're going to just run. So Hophni and Phinehas went forward and they put down the ark and Israel saw the ark and they just way, again, very un-British, very un-Canadian. They just jump up and they shout and they scream. 
so much so that the Philistines hear them. And they're like, whoa, what are these guys shouting at? And they're like, they've just brought that Ark of the Covenant to the front line. And the leader of the Philistines just was like, oh, man. He could feel everyone's heart just like sinking. And he's just like, oh, okay, we're in real, real trouble now. We're going to have to fight 10 times harder to beat these guys because God has just turned up. And they do. And Israel is just full of sin and they've made huge mistakes and they've used the Ark of the Covenant as just like this, this lucky charm because they're not really acting in faith, they're acting in superstition. And so God lets them have it and the Philistines give them a right kick in and they take the Ark of the Covenant away from Israel and Israel's just like completely broken. But the Ark of the Covenant is just like the holiness, the glory of God on earth. And they are immediately are affected by it. They're terrified by it. And so, and they have, but they have it for 30 years and so much goes wrong to them that in the end they give it back. But they don't do it themselves with their hands because they're terrified of it. And they send, off these, they send it off on this big cart. And this bloke, he finds it, and he's, he's uh, uh, from Israel, and he's like, the Ark of the Covenant's back, and everyone's really, really excited. Uh, by this time, David is king, and David wants the Ark of the Covenant. It's the covenant, it's the agreement between God and his people, and he has now taken Jerusalem, and he's like, this is the city of God, we need the presence of God in this city. So he sends the blokes, he sends the priests to go and uh, pick up the Ark of the Covenant and they start walking with it and one of the horses stumbles and the Ark slips and one of the guys called Isaiah, he goes and just stops so the Ark doesn't fall and boom! He is unclean and he is killed immediately. And everyone like puts down the Ark and they're petrified, obviously. And David's like, oh man, he's really angry because... God's anger is broken out against the people. So he says, okay, go and take it to this guy called um, Obed-Edom. That's a bloke's name. I don't know why he's called Obed-Edom, but he is. And uh, they, they drop the Ark of the Covenant off really carefully at Obed-Edom's house. And, and David waits. And he just keeps sending uh, like troops in to say, how is Obed-Edom? Like, is he dead? Is, is the Ark killed him? Is it, how is this guy? And, and they say, actually, he's, he's like doing brilliantly. He's, everything's great. Uh, his crops are really growing. Everything's going fantastic in his house. The Lord is blessing him. There's no anger. It's just the blessing and the glory and the holiness of God is filling Obed-Edom and everything that he has. And David is just like, I want that. I want that. So he does it all properly and he sends the priests and they go there and they, they make the right poles and they do it exactly how you should do through Leviticus and they lift up the Ark of the Covenant and David goes with them as the king because he's like got everything. David has got everything but he realizes he's not God and he needs God. And so they go and get the presence of God and when they've gone just six steps Six steps, they stop and they're like, yay! And they have a party and they slaughter animals because they love doing that. And, and it's just like messy and bloody, but they were just like ecstatic because they were alive and God was still with them. And they just keep doing this. I don't know how many animals they went, they went through, but they just keep doing this and they, and they walk all the way back to Jerusalem. And when they get to the gates of Jerusalem, David it just cannot contain himself any longer and he strips off his coat. He totally humbles himself, recognizing that he is not God. But God is coming into the city of God and he strips off his clothes and he dances before the Lord with all his might. You cannot hold this guy down. He is passionate. He is he is fully in. He recognizes that he is weak and God is everything. And he wrote Psalm 24 coming out of this moment of celebration. And in Psalm 24, it says this. I'm just going to go from verse 7. It says, lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? 
the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Can you see the connection now with the Palm Sunday? How the King of glory, how that was the blueprint of the holiness, the glory of God coming into the city. And here you have Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the glory of God entering the city of God. And the people, who they don't really understand it, but they know they're seeing something supernatural and they cannot contain themselves. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the people who are just stuck in religion and th their faith is a million miles away from what they're just, they look like. They pull Jesus to the side and they say, stop, stop, stop. You've got to tell them to stop saying what they're saying. Because it's just wrong. And Jesus says, have you not heard that from the lips of children I have ordained praise? Where he was, he was connecting them with Psalm 8. And Psalm 8 is a psalm of creation. Where it talks about how creation was created. And he, Jesus, was the one who created it. It was so obvious to them. If you look at their context, it was so obvious. And the other bits they were speaking were from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is a, is a psalm of deliverance. It was written by David, but thank you for saving us from our enemies, from delivering us. And Jesus is walking in to deliver them, to deliver them from the sin that is holding their lives, which is oppressing them. He has come to bring deliverance from the greatest enemy, from sin itself, to reconcile them back to God. Jesus is just, he is fully taking on this moment. And the disciples are in it, but it's not until afterwards that their eyes of their heart are opened and they see all of this stuff in the Old Testament and then they put two and two together and glory be, they get it. It is amazing. Where two or more are gathered, we are told, Jesus says, I am with you. The King of glory is walking into the city of God to bring life everlasting. He's still amongst us now. The King of glory is with you. Where two or more are gathered in prayer. There's more than two of us here, let me tell you. The kingdom of God is advancing in you and in me. The kingdom of God is advancing. Jesus is still marching. The holiness of God, the glory of God is still advancing. It's a dynamic. He's never stopping. But just like the Pharisees can push Jesus away, so can we. And this year has sucked. The last 12 months has sucked, hasn't it? It's been awful. Jesus is saying, lift up your heads. Lift up your heads that the king of glory may come in. Lift up your heads in your homes, in your families, that the king of glory may come in. Lift up your heads in your workplaces. In where the places where you serve, in the places where you earn your keep. Lift up your heads that the King of glory may come in. Lift up your heads in your schools that the King of glory may come in. Lift up your heads, church, that the King of glory may come in. Because he's knocking. He is knocking because there's a mission to be had and we have the privilege, the privilege to be carrying his baton and he wants us to advance.
And you'll be glad to know it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> and you don't have to have a great plan. And you don't have to feel that you are worthy. And you don't have to feel that you'll have everything in place before you start. Because he's the one who's doing it. All you have to do is say, here I am, Lord. Send me. And he will take you and use you. And the supernatural kingdom of God that these people are absolutely ecstatic about will happen through you. Jesus has promised it. He has promised it. And it will happen. It just takes you to say, yes, Lord, here I am, use me. And he will lead you through his spirit. He will empower you through his spirit. He will equip you through his spirit. And we will do this together and he will lead us. And you do not have to have the answers. He is the answer. David had everything, but what he recognized was he has nothing without the Lord. But with the Lord, he has everything. There's a lot in there, and it's really quite simple. Are you willing? What are your expectations? Are they like these people whose expectations were broken and wrong? Or do you have a different expectation of the Messiah and King? And then here's just one to really rattle you. What are his expectations of us? What does Jesus expect from us? Let's just pray. Jesus, you are the king of glory. And we lift our heads to you. We thank you that you have placed your hope within each one of us. And we may not fully understand what that is, but we ask that you would make that clear to us, that we would just turn to you with hearts that are willing, that we would say yes to you. And I pray, I pray that as we leave this place now, that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. I say, come, Holy Spirit. Transform us and renew us. Challenge us and hone us. And use us for your glory. May we be blessed and may we be a blessing. May we be aware of you all of this week. In everything that we do. And I pray that we would be focused on you. And that you would give us courage to step out in faith. We ask this for your glory, our King. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go and have a glorious and brilliant week. Amen.